So, our topic today, looking at the human being in body, soul, and spirit, this threefoldness. This is something Rudolf Steiner worked on throughout his life, looking at this aspect of threefoldness. And it comes in so many different areas. I'll try and um, give pictures of that today. No, this is, perhaps we don't need to spend starting point, O oh man, know thyself. In Plato's work, he, he always puts his words into Socrates' mouth. No, the other one. Sorry, but yeah, that's right. Um, use the maxim, know thyself, as an explanation to Phaedrus for why he has no time for mythology or other far-flung topics, he calls them. Socrates says, but I have no leisure for them at all. And the reason, my friend, is this. I am not yet able, as the Delphic inscription has it, to know myself. So it seems to me ridiculous when I do not yet know myself to investigate irrelevant things. <laughs> to know thyself. How many people do you know yourself? Yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> later on we'll be looking at um, evolution in four great stages and so I've said well yes uh, this must also apply to education and this might say four stages in the evolution of education as Rudolf Steiner gives it and I put these here the first one is he gives here what I call a cosmic spiritual archetype. He talks about what is the human being as in its wholeness. Look at that. Because you can't educate anyone if you don't know what a human being is. I mean, it was, it's ridiculous, isn't it, to think that you're going to educate a child if you have no idea or insufficient idea of what a human being is, because that's what they're growing into. So it's a very important part. And then the second stage is what they call the soul's journey from, you know, birth to death. But as Rudolf Steiner says, from before birth to through birth to death and after death. Uh, those are all important parts. So this is more a journey. So one's like kind of like a big structural picture. The other now brings time into it. And then... Then you look at, then the next one, sorry, is the life and learning, is that you're looking at different stages of life, how you need to uh, change the learning uh, to be appropriate. So we have it in the sense that in the kindergarten, when children are under seven, there's a certain form and structure to the education, seven to 14, a different way of learning, from 14 to 21, right through life, there are kind of different processes to do with learning. So this, you might say, is a, is a third stage. And finally, the specific individual curriculum. We have the situation, we put children in classes. We classify children by saying they're of the same age, therefore probably having similar experiences. But that is still very broad. Teachers have to then, and parents, have to take beyond that and say about individuals. That in a class of children may be going through similar experiences, but you need to know an individual child. They'll show their individuality by how they differ from the norm. So, you know, there's uh, something on average. So that you have to know what different children are going through. So it's going from the very broad to the very specific so those are kind of stages that Rudolf Steiner brings in uh, education. So this is looking at this cosmic spiritual archetype, as I call it. The human being, pictured as a threefold, a threefold entity of soul, spirit, and body. And this human being spends periods of time, that is lifetimes, incarnated, in, incarnate, carnate means to do in the flesh, in the flesh, on earth, alternating with time in a purely spiritual dimensions, which happen after death and before birth. 
And so that there's a time, it's a kind of huge breathing from breathing to being into a body and on the earth, and breathing out into being just purely in a spiritual realm, then coming back into another lifetime. And this, you might say, was well known in ancient times and you might say was got gradually forgotten over the centuries and in a way Rudolf Steiner uh, was reviving it. Now, we look at then these, some aspects of these three. The human soul, in its feeling experience of the present, is a meeting ground of the human spiritual individuality, coming from the spirit, and carrying that um, with the self-determining purpose and intentions for future actions. So that's what comes from the spirit. Work, working in the future, where am I going? That is an element of the spirit. Uh, so the purpose and intentions. And they come into this body, and the body, the uh, nature of the human being, carrying the hereditary, f hereditary form, instincts and memories from the past. So your body is a summation of the past, as it were, that you know, that you've got from your parents, your ancestors, you were given this thing, you might say it's a summation of evolution up to the, mo up to the present moment, then you take it and you're going to carry it forward. And, and so the soul is the meeting ground of the past and the future as in the spirit. And these experiences you have in your soul, you might say soul is the place of personal experiences which we we differentiate as thinking, feeling, and willing. These are kind of the soul experiences. And that's where we very, live very much in the present. Gradually these, I know these are condensed ideas, but gradually they'll take on a bit of life as you work with them. So now let's look at the threefoldness um, from the of just simply the body, and this you'll see there's a bit more to what is on your sheet. Now, so we're saying, to rub this off, that the head, we've got head, chest, and limbs. That's the threefoldness we see within ourselves. Here, the head, the chest region, and the limbs, which of course your legs and your arms. There's a there's a three aspects there. Now. just very diagrammatically of head, chest, and limbs. I suppose I can put on other limbs. Five. So the, the aspect, you know, of the head, it has a kind of spherical part, and you might say the most spherical part is this back part here. And as you come forward, it, uh, particularly around here then, it's no longer spherical. As you come forward from the spherical part here, it becomes a dodecahedron here, and then, you know, all in this whole jaw, it really drops out of the spherical. And so that this sort of, it's the aspect of it is bone on the outside and really might say the soft part of the brain on the inside. Let's go to the opposite end and the legs they are not round but they are you know like if you take a sphere you can have the roundness or you can have what's called radial. You can see that in a way the limbs 
have quite a different character in that you can say they radiate. If you can take one bone, two bone, five, you know, that goes out. It's interesting, it's not one, two, four, unless you take it like that, but it's, you know, it's always interesting aspects of mathematics in it. And so that there, where are the bones? On the inside. And the muscle and flesh is on the outside. So just in those gestures, they're really, pol you know, polar opposite. Um, and then look at the chest. You see, in a way, the chest has a roundness. You know, and bones here, you know, the chest. But, but the ribs are like the limb bones, but bent. So it's a kind of a halfway in between. And instead of whereas the head, you know, after a few months, the whole head bones all knit together. You know, if you look at a skull, you'll find a kind of the serrations where they kind of knit together. And the very top part doesn't knit together until a child's 12 months, 18 months old. But here with the limbs, you can see that with the ribs, that they can, they can get a rhythmical movement. So there's a kind of in-between place for, for these. They're sort of, uh, they're enclosing, and yet they're separate. So there's a wonderful linking between those two. Um, <clears throat> and so what have we got? So the ribs, they're flexible. The limbs have flesh on the outside, they're radial. And then, what goes on in them? Inside, you might say, inside the head, the brain is the center of the nervous system. But what else goes on in the head? It's the scent. Judgment. Yes, that's a little bit further down line, a little bit before we get to the judgment stage. What is this head the center for? It's for most of our senses. That is the way that things come into, um, into us through the ears, the eyes, the nose and the mouth, and of course the skin. But with the skin, of course that then covers the whole body. But majorly our sort of communication comes, strangely enough, through this hard, bony thing. You know, this interesting ears are set in the hardest, hardest bones of the body around here. Um, that, you know, see, all that comes in from the outside comes in through the head part, through the sort of, so the sense nerve. So, uh, part there, the brain, the head of the nervous system. Of course, it goes down through the spinal column and into these other places. Um, whereas the key thing for the limbs is that they, um, they have muscles and they have blood in the muscles. That's the important part. It's sort of the whole, this, um, this last part is sometimes called the limb metabolic system. So he's really counting the sort of the stomach region and, and the limbs because in the stomach, that's where the digestion goes on. All the food is digested, and so you can get the energy into the blood that you can move your muscles. And so this whole thing here, that this limbs are where you're active, the willing element. Whereas here, you want your head to be still. I really have great sympathy for woodpeckers trying to think. <laughs> You know, just try donging your head a bit and you think, whoa, my brain gets sore even just thinking about it. You know, that their brain gets rattled around. You know, they in the hard wood. I mean, the thought life of woodpecker can't be very exciting. It's a great title for a book. <laughs> well, you can write it. Um, but so, yes, there's, um, we like the head to be still in order to be able to reflect. You know, that in a pond, you need the water to be fairly still for it to reflect, not to have too many ripples on it. And, but so 
here you might say this is the reception area where things come in. It's a kind of selfish part, and so that, that is where things are received. And it's in the limbs, it's more in these limbs that you can give. I mean, of course, there is a, is a, is a receiving as well, uh, is a receiving as well, but there's also that possibility of giving your work in the world come through your limbs, not too much through your head. And then in between, the lung and the heart. It's interesting, there's two things. The lung is more connected with the head and the heart is more connected with the limbs. That probably takes some further explanation, but it's... Um, um, <coughs> yes, but it's the, the blood and, you know, there's, there's all sorts of interesting things that... When Rudolf Stein talks about the heart, he says one of the things that people today will have to overcome and that is the idea that the heart is a pump. Can you imagine, you know, it's sort of like saying instead of saying to someone, oh I love you with all my heart, you went up there, I love you with all my pump. <laughs> Very romantic. <laughs> um, you see, the heart is more than that. Obviously there is an element where it's sort of putting there's a connection of pulsing uh, with the blood but you know the pulsing in the blood comes before the heart is formed if you look in an embryo the blood is already pulsing and then the heart is formed later <coughs> that's an interesting conundrum um, but also that if the heart was only a pump it would only need two chambers not four one to connect with the body, one to the pulmonary system, into the lungs. You know, that's, uh, blood goes to the lungs to be refreshed, and then through the body, uh, where it is, brings energy and life to the body. But so this one part of the, with the heart, is that the incoming blood, it's received. It's the oracle, isn't it? I can't try to remember. Uh, it's sort of received there. It's almost like that. Sort of like it's like a waiting chamber it comes in, and it's like a, a kind of sensing process that says, "It's like saying to the blood, well, you've come from all over the body. What's going on? You know, it's a kind of sensing process for the all that's in the in the body itself, and the same with the other one that comes back as a sensing because when it goes to the blood, goes to the lungs. The lungs connect with the outer world, bring the air inside, and there's a kind of connecting. So if you can think of the heart having a sense organ, as well as um, a muscle thing. So you have, it's got a sense organ, as well as muscles. But if you just think of it as only a muscle, you're, you're missing out half the truth. So you just need to just sort of be, uh, think of those things. Yes, Holly. Okay, to off track, I just wanted to add a little point. I don't know if you've ever seen um, or heard of HeartMath. There's like an institute that um, studies the heart and its emotional relation. And there's, there's like a study where they connect something to your heart and a little sensor and some yogurt. And if you send, like say, like mm -hmm. the yogurt responds to what your, your heart is feeling. It's really wow. crazy. Heart math. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the things that people like, choose like, to do. Uh, it's, like, it's like little, some little like, it reacts. Um, yeah, reacts. Like a little, mm. you guys know what I'm talking about? Yes, yes. I've, I've seen it. Great. <laughs> I've seen it. Not very good at articulating it's with you. Mm. If you shout at your other, it will react. Yeah. And in one way, you will send blood and it will react. I think it's just interesting what people choose to do. Yes. <laughs> what they choose to study. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that in itself is fascinating. Yeah. 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 But you see, this threefoldness, we see in general is a threefoldness, but you can look at also here there's a threefoldness. One, a one, a two, a three. You know, the, and then you know, here a threefoldness. 
and also in the head there's a threefoldness. You can take the top part, you might say this is head head. And this part, the nose, connects with the lungs. So it is the, that's the rhythmical element connecting with this part of us. And this part of the jaws are the, are the limbs of the head. So you can put your, when you speak, of course, you're using this. And it's interesting, do you know how many teeth a young child has? Have ten here and ten there. You have ten fingers on your hands, so this is like this one. And you, you find some, this Leon Mays, uh, this doctor, anthroposophical doctor, it makes a whole picture of how these are connected. He said that, um, but he takes a whole other theme that Rudolf Steiner says that your head is a picture of your last lifetime, but that's going a little bit. If you want to follow it up, here, follow this book on the skeleton by Leon Mays. But it's, it's interesting. So here is a limb element of the head, here's the rhythmic system, and even the eyes are like. They're round and spherical like the top part of the head. So you find it sort of um, reflect, you know, that sort of that threefoldness is there. But not only that, look at the teeth. What kinds of teeth have you got? You've got incisors, the so-called eye teeth or carnivore teeth, and the ones at the back, the molars. And you find that those are Thing. What kind of animals have incisors very strongly? Uh, rodents. Rodents, the ones that gnaw. Mice, rats, gu guinea pigs, or whatever, you know, those things. And what's the state of consciousness of a mouse? <laughs> very alert, very alert, they're very sharp and very nervous. It's also interesting that with mice they proliferate incredibly too. That um, you might say it's part of the nature of mice to have many generations in order to feed the cats. Sorry, I'm, you know, um, but cat, cats don't feed other but it's just, it's an interesting picture. And then you go back to the next teeth. Which kind of animals have these, so we call it the eye teeth. It's then the cat family, the, you know, the tigers, the lions, those sort of things, and, and a number of other animals that, you know, that meat eating that comes from these ones. And then and they are the ones that have much more a rhythmical system that is well developed. So that the, um, if you ever see a tiger or a lion in motion, you know, they are incredibly rhythmical in just the way they, uh, you know, they, they run. You know, it's incredible. It's, and this, they've got this powerful lung system uh, there and rhythm. And then you go to the ones that, the animals that have the molars at the back. Moo. <laughs> chewing grass. Not meat, chewing grass. I mean, you look in the mouth of a horse, it's got teeth in the front, teeth at the back, but it doesn't have any carnivores at all. Um, and so this is this chewing of grass. So this is very much into the metabolic system. You know, a cow has four stomachs. We are have quite happy with one that has four because this digestion of grass, you know, I mean, we wouldn't last long if we went out and ate grass for, as our main, main dietary thing. You know, it's so really this taking this, uh, this fiber and digesting it and making milk, you know, which is such a, an incredible... Um, substance really as a as a nourishment you know that's um, that the the milk the the cow's milk and but 
But anyway, this comes through. You can see the threefoldness through the animal world reflected in our teeth, and we have a kind of balance within us. Um, yes, I'm not aware of anyone that sort of, you know, like grows. You know, these ones can grow into tusks and so on. I don't have I'm seen any people with tusks, though they try to make it so in these vampire movies, don't they? Is that what they do? <laughs> Which is sort of an total aberration of the human image. It's just, yeah, these are, these are fascinating. You have a feeling these people have no idea what a human being is. I don't know. So, there. Um, so anyway, this threefoldness is uh, is you know quite is very interesting. Now say the the element of these part that whereas the animals having these are much more balanced as it were, and these one hold the earth, and then the limb element of the head has to become much stronger. You know that a cow does have to use its head to feed itself. It has to use its jaw to bite the grass and so on, and all those sort of things. Whereas we have the ability to make a real differentiation between our forelimbs and our hind limbs. You know, that we dedicate our limbs here to holding us on the earth. So that, you know, we have a situation, as I was saying, this last stage of coming into here that is to sort of straighten our legs, lift our head, and have a mobile neck. You know, if you've got your head like this, you have to have such strong muscles just to hold it up. You know, I mean, if we went along, we would get a very sore neck muscle uh, quite quickly. So we have this wonderful thing that our head is balanced and we can look up and see the stars. And so that we have this thing, no other creature can actually, as it were, lift and lock its legs back here like this. Uh, and so to be able to stand straight. And you can see that there's a kind of thing with all our, all our main joints. Here, here, elbows, wrists. We're all in a, they can all stand in one plane. And essentially right at the top of that is our organ for balance. There's a, well, perhaps that's sort of, but that's sort of, no, that's not quite relevant to this, sorry. Um, so that's part of the threefoldness of the human being. And there are many other aspects you can look at and, and you know, investigate more. And you can see that, that instead of things being uniform, there's a kind of separating out. Let's move on, we we'll, won't get there. Now this one is something we'll keep coming back to because it's a very full diagram. Uh, and we'll actually go, go on and come back. And this is looking at, you know, saying the three aspects of um, the human being. Here is representing what I call the body. This part's to do with the soul and this part's to do with the spirit. And what Rudolf Steiner does is it is that each of these gets can be divided up into a threeness. So the physical body, so there's not just just that he says there's an aspect that you say is uh, sorry of the body. One part is physical, the other is he calls the life body or etheric body, and then an astral body. So it's a threeness, but it's connected with. You might say this first one here with the mineral world, the plant world, and the animal world. So here I've got here physical, solid form and mineral, the etheric or life world with the plants. And that's the liquid and lymph and sap, all the moving parts in the body. But when you're alive, your blood is flowing, the lymph is flowing, all these things, these liquids flow. When you die, that stops. Everything, it just, all that just comes to rest. So that this, this whole etheric body is connected with these, the flowing part that gives us life. And the astral part for the, for the animal world is when 
we take the whole breath into our lungs. We bring the lungs inside. Whereas the plant has its leaves outside, quite reveals itself, we bring that in and we have an inner life. At least once we get over eight or nine, we, we don't sort of put it all out into the world. We have an inner, we have an inner life. Whereas the plants show themselves, they reveal themselves. You know, so we have these, we look at the plant and we see all the different, the leaves and the flowers. There's a kind of whole revelation of their being there that we uh, can take that aspect into ourselves. Um, and this thing, you get to know, you, I can remember when I was first studying it all the time, I think, oh, etheric body, what on earth is the etheric body? I keep on hearing about it, I can never work out what is the etheric body. And, and I think sometimes the way to, uh, to answer it is to say, what's the difference between, I say, a rock and a rose? And then you begin to see all that is that goes on the rose or the plant's side, you can see this is an attribute of the etheric body. So what is it, you know, if you think of a stone and a plant, what are some of the things that are different that you'll notice? And you have to, as Rudolf Stein says, you have to do, have kind of observations that are not mechanical as you get with, uh, he says, you know, the trouble with modern science is that all the, um, the measurements, the, the observations tend to be mechanical, and now they can get a little meter out and they can measure it, like with the yogurt and so on. Uh, that that um, it's more, there had to be more subtle observations, you might say. So when you say, with compared, what is it, if I see something and I say, I know that's a plant and that's not a plant. And you could almost say that you see a plant that's dead has lost something. What has it lost? So what can you... Right. It's so, it's yeah, yeah, okay, but now we, that's a name. Now I want you to describe the qualities that belong to it. Yes, Brandy. Is growth, yes, that's a, a very key one, growth, that the plant grows. What does it mean by growing? That one day and the next it will have changed. Uh, the, you have to be watch a little bit carefully there in the sense that sometimes you may have done in class, in school, taking a crystal and making it grow. So it's, you just have to watch it a little bit. Just a moment, Jared. And so... But the thing is with a crystal, it just gets bigger and bigger. Can you imagine, on the other hand, you're given a little experiment and you say, right, here's a bean seed. I want you to put it in cotton wool and water and let it be damp and let it grow. Imagine that, uh, you know, and you have a crystal growing there and you came back after a week and you saw the bean had gone big like this. And a fortnight later, there was a huge bean, then a great big bean. The thing with a bean, of course, is that continually changing, new things are appearing, whereas the crystal is just getting bigger. And so one notes the difference with growth, growth with metamorphosis. So, in a sense, growth with metamorphosis is the key thing. Do you know? space and temperature, but it also needs certain other aspects in terms of its relationship to heaven and earth, and when it dies, it loses that relationship, it falls over. Yes, the whole thing we brought there of the something that, and it varies from different plant species to another, it has some element that is earth-oriented with the roots, and something more heaven-oriented, usually with the, uh, the flowering and fruiting. Well, there's the flowering in particular, because the fruiting is already coming back to earth. One's rising up, top coming down. Yes, some other, other things that where you see the difference. Growth, 
Yes. Vitality. Vitality, yes. How, how would, yes, ex explore that idea a bit more. Well, for example, if you're someone who doesn't tend to your plants as well as you could daily, but over, mm -hmm. say, a week's period, there's some days where you rush to water them because you see them looking all them, and, and then maybe some days you water them too much and they're, they're turgid, the leaves are thick with water, but they're yellowish now, <laughs> you know. Or you just those different conditions of, yes, it's still alive, but is it in a great state? Is it dark green and flourishing? Or is it yellow and kind of soggy and maybe spotted? You know, there's just different things that can happen to it, even though it's still growing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes? Sorry, somebody else? Yes, Molly? Um, this is similar to what she's saying, but if you're looking at a dead plant, it's really lost the integrity of its structure. There yes. There is no more structure anymore. Yeah. Yes, it's, it, it loses, it loses, it, it's right, is a right element and a wrong element, but you see, wood, concave structure, but it loses moisture. And so there's an element, there is something there that you can retain. And in a certain sense, the wood of a trunk has already excluded itself from the living process. Yeah. But it's, yes, there's something of that integrity is lost, particularly it is the fluid and liquid part that disappears. Yeah. Yes, Melissa. Uh, it also loses its orientation toward the sun. It leaves your turn. Yeah, yeah. The Anything of that. Yes, that's right. And you can actually take that a little bit back further. You know, the sun, what does the sun do for the plant? The sun can warm a rock and it gets hotter. What does the sun do for a plant? Photosynthesis. It's the photosynthesis. Yes, that's a key part. So that's very much to do with the life process, is the photosynthesis. It's a kind of, it's a kind of digesting process. But it means that also before that there has to be something that's characteristic of living things. With the leaves, what happens in the leaves? Movement. Hmm? Movement. Not so much the movement, I mean there can be, but the movement from a plant comes from the wind from the outside. You don't see um, a tree uh, or a plant from the inside waving its leaves. That's, it's, that's something comes from the outside, whereas we, who brought our lungs inside, can bring movement from the inner part. There's a, an interesting connection with the, the fact that creatures that bring lungs and air into themselves are able to move themselves rather than be moved from the outside. But what else happens with the, um, with the leaves? Hello, can we help you? Melissa is here. I won't bother. What's the key function of the leaves? Other than this, this um, photosynthesis, but what on the other side of the plant? Uh, Holly. Well, breathing. The carbon dioxide can breathe carbon dioxide. Yes, they breathe. They breathe. You see, a rock can have air passing through it. I mean, I'm thinking of pumice. Do you, do you have pumice in this country? Mm -hmm. You know full of holes. Air can go through it and it has no relation whatsoever to the stone. But with air in a plant it has to have a relationship that once it comes through you might say the skin of the plant it's as it were received and, and then it's dissolved into the sap and then with that the photosynthesis changes into sugars, and the sugars then will move about the plant to where they're needed. All that's a kind of life process that leads to there, doesn't stay there. With something that's dead, no movement, no change. Right, that's the movement I'm talking about. Yeah, okay, thank you. Well, that's great. <laughs> yeah, Jared. Well, there's also the issue of, and of course, you can connect water to the growth of a crystal to some degree, like in terms of a geo. And mm. the amount of minerals that are contained in the water and yeah. the flow is right, that can cause a crystal to grow. But 
things that are living plants, they have to have a way to absorb water and move the water through them. And if we want taller plants, we need a vascular system that can connect the leaves to the roots. Otherwise, the water can't get from the ground yeah. to the plant. And I think water, I mean, obviously water is, to me, when we talk about the etheric body and we want to talk about L now. Yeah, that's important. Yeah. In fact, when, when we talk about breathing, we have to sort of take a broad picture of breathing. And for the plant, it's actually what comes into it. So coming through this normally through, largely through the roots, and maybe a little bit through the leaves, uh, the water coming in. So anything that's coming into the plant is a kind of breathing process. For us, we would put into the same thing the air, the water and our food is also is ingesting something coming from the outside that comes in and we take hold of it and and um, make it our own whereas the, the mineral are like things you could pour water over a pumice and the air and it doesn't have anything it's not received by the organism or the structure of the of the rock it just passes on through with no change well, with little change anyway. Um, so these begin to see that these, all of these things, the organizing of that, sometimes, um, yeah, there's like organizing forces. This is what the etheric is about, that it brings about the life, and there's a life, a process, is the issue, a movement that, that brings that um, there. There's, there's one thing that hasn't been mentioned, there's because there's seven major things. We talk about breathing, um, or, and then receiving it, something that is dissolved, you know, the air is resolved, it's digested, and then it's moved to where it's needed. Uh, there's something, then another part is that the plant also maintains itself, you know, that it uh, doesn't wilt, you keep it, the, it sort of... Um, uh, can maintain itself and then the growth and finally it produces seeds it can reproduce you don't find little rocks little dropping off little rock here here come on you can grow be a big rock you know doesn't happen like that sorry you said seven and i was following you with breathing digestion movement no you need to have breathing rudolf Anna calls it warming receiving receiving and then digesting um and then what he calls secreting, that is, things have to go to the right place. Otherwise, you'd have the leaves full of sugars. Uh, they're not needed. The sugars need to go elsewhere. They become cellulose or um, etheric oils and, you know, and um, starch, all those things. They get changed. So they need to move for that. And then the maintaining is that you need to keep it alive and then beyond that growing, and then finally new life uh, reproduction. There's a sort of, a, the, you might say, the seven characteristics of the, uh, of the etheric body. We'll come back to that because yeah, you need the same ideas for learning. Now, how are we going? Ten minutes. Um, now, let's, perhaps we can say that Yes, it's interesting that um, even these things move a bit together, for these, that they don't always stay quite so, as it were, integrated, that we find here, what Rudolf Stein sometimes calls these higher things, he sometimes puts under the term of ego, ego, this whole spiritual component that comes into the body. And then he says, sometimes you can have the ego gets a little bit lifted out of the body and then you have a moment of forgetting. Oop, you're a bit out of yourself. <laughs> you have to come back in. And then he says that this whole astral body, that when you go to bed at night, your astral body doesn't entirely leave, but it leaves the physical body with all its life processes lying in a bed and the etheric body is usually very glad that the astral body is gone because it's a real disturbance and it can carry on and you can get healed. So normally when you're ill, 
you go to bed, lie down, go to sleep, and uh, and hopefully the the whole disturbing astral body is sort of allows the etheric body to heal the physical body. And so that's the time of sleeping. But if you find the life body leaves the physical body, that's the big sleep, death. <laughs> So here's the littlest of sleep, forgetting, you know, it's sort of, um, sometimes you could call it daydreaming. It's a, it might be, it's forgetting, but sometimes, you know, it almost goes with the breathing rhythm, of the sort of uh, being, when you breathe in, you're just a little bit more focused, and you breathe out, oh. it, there's breathing in all sorts of different levels. This one breathing, of course, is day and night. Whereas this one was the ordinary breath, and this one is a lifetime. And there's an interesting relationship uh, in the numbers there. Um, what else can we say about this? That Yes, but here, there's three things that with the, with the physical body, this is this whole law of heredity belongs just to, the phys just to the bodies only. That's what you get from the past. For there's a different law for the soul, it's called the law of karma. Um, the next slide will say something, other. and with the spirit, the law there is that of reincarnation. So let's have a look at that in the, whoops, yes, the law of heredity. You see, this is the past. This is what you get from your parents and your ancestors. Now, um, and you might say in the first seven years of life, the character, you get the characteristics of your ethnic race and that of humanity builds out. You know, the child is, um, a, a young child is almost generic, isn't it? You know, it's sort of a, a beautiful child. And then grad you can see perhaps even when it's born, it sort of comes from a certain ethnic background, but it's, in other words, its features are fairly general. And as it gets old, you can begin to see the family or uh, even the, the sort of ethnic grouping. That comes through in those first seven years quite strongly. And you might say you get, this is the kind of physical characteristics. Then in the second seven years, you get something you might say, of the etheric qualities of the family, so that the, the habit life and what goes on around a child, they start to imbibe that in the second seven years, which is what's the time they're going to school. And then the astral tendencies, uh, dispositions, passions of the parents. So this is, you might say, this is the whole of humanity or even the, maybe the ethnic race, here your forebears, and here now down to the parents and their particular passions is something of the teenage years. So these are interesting, but they're all things from the past that stand there, and they're not you. They're part of your situation. I like to say it's, it's like a nest. You come in, there's a, these are all the things that are around you, and you have to come in and move forward from there. You have to modify it. It's, that's just sort of it's what the, the gift of the world to you. You have to take it and make it your own. So that's the law of heredity. Applies to our body. At different stages, what we inherit becomes evident. The law of karma applies to our soul. And the thing with our soul is that we form, we come into communities and we have soul connections with other people. This is where, this is our main connection. You know, our bodies are individual, but with our souls we can connect to others. And this law of karma is quite an interesting one, which is one of the things that Rudolf Steiner really felt it urgent for him to bring, that it's to do with cause and effect in the realm of the soul between people. And it's saying, actions have future consequences for one's destiny. Now, you know that you can do something, and you do that in the present, but you know the present is very quickly into the past, and it's gone. 
But um, you see that in, in the simplest sense, when you go to bed at night and you wake up in the morning, you might like think, oh, I just like to forget yesterday and start again. It doesn't happen. The things that you have done and what you have said to other people lives on and comes back to meet you. Now, you can see that in a very general sense in day-to-day -day things, but Rudolf Stein says that this is, works on a much longer scale as well. That what you do in the world plants a seed that will come back and meet you later on. And he even says it be such that the things you do in one life can come back and meet you in another lifetime. So he puts this as a, a huge, a huge picture that um, there are consequences for your actions. I think it's jolly good there are consequences for your actions. This may be something to answer at a future time, but this is a very um, living question for me. If you, can you affect the law of your own personal karma by wanting to be more conscious of it? In other words, it may have gotten away from you in the action, but if your desire is quickly conscious of what happened and wanting to make amends or can you actually welcome the karmic consequences more quickly by being more conscious of your actions? And would it be then the reverse that someone who's more unconscious would maybe, it's more willy-nilly when, when the karmic response may come? Um, you know, we talked about action research yesterday. That's what that's about. So you, I, it seems to me to indicate that you could actually try to participate in saying, yes, please give me, not my punishment, but my karmic response, because I'm really <laughs> not, as, not as a punishment. <laughs> uh, it's like saying, some people say, you have actions, and you can wait for your next lifetime uh, for it to come back and meet you. And you think, uh-oh, here comes this nemesis that I... But also, you could say, I don't have to wait to my next lifetime. At the end of the day, I can reflect on the encounters I had in that day, and you can ask the question, what do I do about it? I mean, this is not taking now the classroom situation, but the life situation. And you don't have to wait for the next lifetime to sort out your karmic mess or muddle or beauty or whatever it is, because there are good things in karma as well, that you do something and people can be very grateful and that comes back as a, a, a feeling of gratitude and warmth, but it also can build up also incredible anger and, and distrust that these things can happen, well, as you know. And so the whole idea of the action research is to get in early and recognize the karma you caused today and what can you do about it tomorrow? You can't always do something about it. You might have killed someone, you had an accident on the road. You can't always do something about it. But that often you can. And so that's the, um, yeah, that's what this whole thing is about. So trying, taking hold of it and beginning to develop responsibility. We'll just look at the last one, then we'll break. And there's a whole lot more pages we haven't looked at. Um, the law of reincarnation applies to the spirit. The sequence of earth lives, where the individuality returns when the earth's conditions have changed sufficiently for further development. So that is a way you have a lifetime and Yes, you go through a whole stage of, you know, of being very malleable and when you're youth and you're getting a bit more fixed in your ways as you get older. There's a whole lot of experiences you have. You die and then there's a time coming back. I need to follow this further. And you wait until times have changed a lot. Rudolf Stein indicates from his researchers that in earlier stages, in these great, he called great um, cycles of um, cultural cycles of the order of you know a couple of millennia, two millennia long, that different individualities might have a male incarnation, a female incarnation, in that bigger cultural epoch. Um, he says, you know, for instance, he says that the cultural epoch that he called the Roman, the Greco-Roman epoch, is sort of 
was um, two millennia going from about the founding of Rome, seven centuries BC, until about the beginning of the Renaissance. He said that was a whole, he called the, he called the Greco-Roman time. You could expect to have had two incarnations there, a male and a female one. But not necessarily, you could have more. But you would like to have at least that. And experience being a male and experience being a female, I believe it's quite different. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and then he says there's other things, the metamorphosis of forces from one life to the next, that something carries on. He says the skills you develop in one life, you can actually harvest as it were a kind of spiritual thing that you can take on and they become the talents at the beginning of the next life. So that's how it sort of... And so you find some children, people who think, you know, they have brought amazing things with them and it's actually a harvesting of a previous lifetime where there has been hard work. To develop skills you have to work hard. It just doesn't happen. You just can't sit back in an easy chair and, and skills will happen. No, it doesn't. You have to work hard at it. So it's the, uh, the skills of one life go on to the next. And it says the forces of the body go into the forms of the face and head of the next life. So sometimes the face you get is a picture of your last life. Interesting. Well, I'll just leave that. I won't explore that further, but a bit frightening sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so Rudolf Steiner covers a huge amount of, these are huge pictures that he's talking about, um, things that will not be revealed by microscopes and, um, and um, scale, balance scales. There have to be a more subtle kind of observation. And again, you don't have to believe any of it, but just think that's an interesting possibility. Does my life experience confirm it in any way, make sense of it? Because if not, you just hold it at arm's length and say, well, that's an interesting possibility, but somewhere maybe something in your life might say, ah, yes, that does make sense of a conundrum, a question I've been carrying that will be uh, just, it just might be something there for you. Otherwise, it's like I said, just a lot of words. Okay, let's break for, let's have our break. <laughs>